Woohoo! So some of us have been through two <laughs> rounds of this, but this is just amazing that we made it through all however many million there are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you both. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, um, Chandra and I are delighted to be here with you. And on this very auspicious evening of rain, evening of a full moon, evening of completing this circle, um, which has been, yeah, we started last August. And we'll do a little bit of reflective practice. Some of you have come to many of these. Uh, maybe this is your first night. <laughs> Wonderful way to start with the end. Um, yeah, really meaningful to think about going through these teachings together uh, using this ancient text, which has uh, made its way to us. It's pretty incredible. You think about how the Lojong text was originally um, retrieved first by Atisha, who had to travel a very dangerous boat journey to um, Indonesia and beg for these teachings and then make his way back. Uh, and then they, of course, were translated again. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Right now we have access, of course, to this incredible worldwide network that we can just type in Lojong slogan, no boat trip, no danger no praying at the, the uh, feet of the teacher, but it's still a journey. It's still a journey to really take these practices on. And I wanna, before we meditate, just kinda remind us a tiny bit of, um, yeah, just the, the goals essentially of the Lojong slogan. So we are indeed um, on number 59 um, of the Lojong slogans. So we've gone through and, and kind of made our way through each one. And of course, Chandra did this um, on her own, I guess, two years before. Um, and then we've done this together. We have a Google Doc with notes. It's 120 pages long now <laughs> that we've just been compiling. Um, and yeah, really lovely. I spent some time just kind of looking over each of these slogans. And um, one by one, they start to just transform us um, and, and change our hearts. And this one this evening, I think is really rich. It's not just a last one, throw away. Um, we'll actually do a little bit of practice related to the slogan. But one thing I, in, in reviewing the notes, one thing that came up to me was actually a quote from dear Lopan Chandra Easton. Um, and she said really early somewhere in our notes, just this beautiful line that um, in Lojong, it's important to have what it offers us is that it offers us a sense of spaciousness with our pain. And that an awakened heart is an open heart, an empty heart, and there's lots of room there. Usually we shield our heart, but Lojong ventilates this space of the heart. So beautiful, ventilating the space of the heart. And these teachings, you know, we began <clears throat> again last August, which was for many of us a, a difficult time, continues to be a difficult time for many of us. Maybe difficult time is <clears throat> quite familiar um, and not unique to the events of the last couple of years. And Lojong is just the perfect training to be with pain. It's, you know, it's antidotes in a way. How do we, how do we work with and keep the heart open as the world is on fire? And what's interesting is the Lojong, you know, there's a couple parts of it. It's, it's not relying only on meditation and it's not only on the teachings. So we really get um, the teachings, the training and the practice all together with the Lojong. And I think that it's, um, yeah, it's been, it's been good medicine, I'd say, for myself in this last year plus. And I think it really um, can invite us to consider how we might be able to continue using. <gasps> Did you guys hear the thunder? Sorry. Wow. Startle response. Oh. Wow. I heard it through you, through your speaker, but not over here in Berkeley. 
Wow. Moment of Rigpa. I kind of missed it, but (laughs) 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 this was very, very loud here. Yeah. Wow. Let's see how long it takes to get over here. (laughs) Wow. Um, Whoo. Enthusiasm for the challenges. Um, Yeah. So I, I just wanted to kind of remind us of, of the, of the logic of these teachings that they're tethered together in this really incredible way to help us transform our mind and transform our hearts. As you have um, likely noticed, we offer and have offered quite a lot of Tonglen practice. That's literally the alchemizing, the practice of turning towards the difficult, that pain, that suffering of our own and of others and inviting it in instead of turning away. Such a radical act, uh, very much like feeding your demons, um, this practice of kind of being with and befriending. And then we've also taught the settling of the mind in its natural state. Allows us to get some of that openness, spaciousness within our own mind. Maybe unhook a tiny bit, this identification with our thoughts of who we are. A lot of the Lojong slogans are about these important points, helping us unwind and loosen some of our ego clinging and helping us have the heart be an organ of transformation. Not a place we feel overwhelmed or despair, not something we try to deny or avoid, but something we exercise, we organize in a specific set of um, steps that really allow us to be with and face everything. So with that, uh, with that preamble, let's go ahead and get ourselves ready for practice here. So let's take a couple moments and find a posture that can really support our practice. Finding our upright spine, inviting the dignity of this practice. Allowing a sense of ease through the abdomen. A gentle lift or tilt of the heart upwards. Finding the head resting evenly on top of the neck, not sloped too far back, not pitching forward. And softening, relaxing and melting tension around the forehead, between the brows. And softening through the eyes and the cheekbones. Relaxing the jaw. You could imagine this day or this week or this lifetime as an enormous backpack of weight, of worry, of planning. Just imagine releasing that weight, just putting it down next to you. For the purposes of this practice, it is not needed.
Let's begin by revisiting the preliminaries, the very beginning of Lojong. These considerations that help prepare us for this journey of meditation, transforming our heart, training our mind. And the first of these preliminaries is to just recognize the sweetness and the preciousness of this life. that we are able to hear and see and receive teachings together. While by no means easy or even stable, this precious human life allows us the possibility to wake up. We have all the ingredients right here. Take a couple moments and allow the mind to mix with this consideration of preciousness of human life. And the second, remembering. Is to remember the reality of impermanence and change. Every single thing that we know is always changing, including us. Making our way from birth until death, in an ongoing cycle of change. Some changes we like, many we don't. Giving ourselves this simple opportunity to reflect on the reality of impermanence and change. Again, not in order to be morbid or dwell, but as motivation for this practice and this journey. Then shifting, now focusing our attention on recognizing the reality of karma. Each and every action and inaction has a result. Being here together, cultivating, Meditating and training has a result. Just as actions may be less wholesome 
or even harmful towards ourselves and others has an imprint. Again, with motivation as our goal, just considering this reality of karma in our own lives. And now shifting to recognizing the unsatisfactoriness, the suffering, the discomfort of living in samsara. Of longing for what we want feeling strong aversion, trying to avoid what we don't want over and over and over and over. So tightly connected to our sense of ego clinging. An idea, an expectation of who we are and want to be, how we prefer to feel which creates so much ongoing struggle and suffering, insufficiency, insecurity. And again, in the spirit of inspiring our meditation and path, take a moment to reflect on the reality of samsara and its suffering. And through seeing the preciousness of human life, the reality of change, through reflecting on the impact of our actions and on the influence of samsara, we shift into the practice of settling our body into a natural state of stillness knowing there is nowhere else that is better to be than right here in this moment, settling the body over and over, no matter how many distractions arise.
and helping us calm the mind and settle the inner speech. Let's take some time to focus on the breath. Noticing the subtle sensations of breath as it travels in and out through the nostrils. Couple more moments here, no matter how many times you have to come back, you're still establishing and working this incredible power of attention and focus. So continue noticing these subtle sensations of breath traveling in and out of the nostrils. And then gently allow the eyes to be partially open, not focused anywhere. We begin this process of settling our mind into its natural state. Inviting a quality of openness and spaciousness. and allowing whatever thoughts arise to simply come and go, creating that precious distance between what is being thought and our moment to moment experience. A thought is not you. Invite a sense of ease and relaxation through the body, a pliancy. And invite that ease and relaxation through the mind, that same pliancy. Thoughts arise like the crest of the wave. 
and subside, just as the wave returns back to the ocean. If the mind feels busy, full of thoughts, distractions, it's okay. Just relax. Allowing the exhale to release. If the mind feels dull, lethargic or tired, invite clarity and refresh your interest. Drawing in that sense of vividness was the inhale. Notice the space between thoughts, the space of awareness, a space that is unbounded, not between your ears and behind your eyes. An infinite open space. Ever so gently allow the eyes to close once again. And feel or imagine that sense of spaciousness still right here. It's from this spaciousness and openness that we can turn our hearts towards others suffering and to our own suffering.
feel the boundlessness and the openness, the capacity of the space to hold everything. And find that pilot light of compassion deep in the heart, always already there. And for our Tonglen practice, let's specifically focus on the pain, the difficulty, the challenge that we face when we feel resentment. We feel that we haven't been heard or seen or appreciated. You can think of a single incident or experience or just bring to mind the flavor of that hurt in the past, in the present, certainly in the future, it may arrive again. Take a moment and connect to that feeling. It can be a very tender feeling. There is a heat, maybe a brittleness with the resentment, yet at its core, a sense of loneliness. Make the reality of this struggle and suffering real and imagine it as though it were a tiny cloud of dark, swirling smoke hovering in front of the belly button line. This dark cloud of resentment, loneliness and hurt. We choose to transform this to include it into our experience in order to release it and be free. So feeling the spaciousness and openness of our awareness while seeing the dark pool and cloud. Our next inhale, we invite in the tendrils of this dark smoke And then exhale, release, transform, clear, light, wishing that feeling of connection and belonging to ourselves. Inhale, drawing in only metaphorically. It's not as though we are bringing smoke inside, closing ourselves up but drawing into the spaciousness of our awareness and then exhaling out. One or two more breaths here. Really engaging with this aspiration of care. seeing, knowing, and feeling the suffering and feeling the heartfelt aspiration to transform. Expanding now our sphere of concern and imagining how many billions of people have experienced the pain of resentment. 
felt unseen or unheard, maybe for days or weeks, maybe for years. Bring these people to mind. Maybe some people you know, and certainly many, many, many people unknown. Again, connecting to that heartfelt desire that these beings be free. And again, using your breath to transform. Imagining all this collective resentment again as a little cloud of swirling black smoke. Inhale, drawing in to the spacious awareness. Exhale, extending out with a wish of love and care, kindness. And continuing to use your breath. Riding on the inhale and exhale, transforming bit by bit. One or two more breaths, drawing in the last tendrils and releasing. And releasing all thoughts, memories, image and aspirations. Just resting once again in the spaciousness of your awareness. Thank you for your practice, everyone. Any questions on the practice for us before we move ahead? That was your full tour.
Okay, maybe we have folks still floating in awareness. Chandra, we can just. I have a question. Oh, good, yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this is primarily just because um, I'm, I'm mostly afflicted with monkey mind and a lot of very active thoughts. And um, I wanted to just sort of throw out this idea of like, is it possible to clear our minds? Is it possible to settle our minds? I'm beginning to wonder that like my, um, this concept of a clear mind is, is not something that I should ever try to achieve, you know, or I, I'm, I'm in a goal oriented state when I'm trying to clear my mind. And I'm also quite happy to just let it spool. Yeah, there's, there's a point at which I become very agitated because my mind isn't it's calming down, right? And I'm, and I'm in a process of trying to settle. And, and all I'm doing now is noticing that, well, I'm not feeling very subtle. And that feels like a really good step for me. But I'm also wondering if you could just share thoughts about like your experiences or, or a, um, a guidebook to the clear mind. Like, what is it? What is, you know, because I, I love what we talk about when we say the open space, space, and the natural state of the mind. But I kind of just feel like there's a lot, there's so much, I mean, and even when you get into sort of metaphysical emptiness and things like that, but there's this kind of sense of like, you know, we as human beings are really probably always, the samsara is we're always gonna have a busy mind. You know, it's it's like, am I, am I even trying to, this just is just occurring to me right now. Is it something I really want? Is it something that I can actually achieve or am I, should I just chill out? You know, <laughs> I guess I just want to sort of hear your hear your thoughts about that. Hear your. Should I pipe in, Eve? Please. First, thank you for that beautiful meditation. So deep, and good question, Jason. It's there are different ways to come at that. I think for me, as a someone who's um holding the mic <laughs> but uh the, the the function of the mind sem in tibetan is or chitta in sanskrit is to think so yes in the sense it will always be generating thoughts and it is very much about shifting the way that we relate to those thoughts do we resist do we cling right so that's something that we can adjust. We can't always adjust. We can't always affect or determine or control the creative effulgence of the mind. It's called the rolpa, which means the creative display of awareness. It's always, it's, 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 it's always manifesting. And so meditation is meant to help us develop more spaciousness around that creative display that's always um, bubbling forth, uh, not to cut it or stop it. You know, like in Chud, in the Chud practice, the severance practice of Machi Glavdran, which is a tantric uh, practice based on the Prajnaparamita sutras, on emptiness, and so on, is all about um, cutting. But what is it cutting? It's not cutting so that the mind is empty or it's about severing or cutting our fixation on all those things that arise. Um, the word for ego in Tibetan is dak zin. Dak zin. Dak means self or identity. And zin, zin, D-Z-I-N. So D-A-G, dak, and then zin, D-Z-I-N, zin, means to grasp, to, to cling. So that is the, that's what, from the Buddhist perspective, is um, the way ego forms, is the way we fixate onto the sense of self. And so in meditation, what we're trying to do is release that grasping, release, and soften, and have more of an open palm approach rather than a gripping. And I notice that when I'm spinning in my namtok, which is the conceptual ideation, there's usually a gripping there. You know, there's a gripping. And so meditation rather than a doing is an undoing. It's an undoing. 
So yeah, you're on to it. Just keep trusting. It's about releasing the doing. How many people have that feeling? Like you sit down meditation, you've been there for a while. And after, you know, maybe after a little too long, you realize, oh, I've still brought that doing mentality. I'm still doing it. I'm still, I'm still here. You know, and that's a great aha moment. I mean, if we can get through before the bell rings to realize that we're, we're doing the doing and that actually meditation is undoing, then, then at least you've had some time there to start unraveling that. And so then the mind becomes more spacious. So the duck zin is the ego fixation, that separate sense of self. Uh, also another word that's similar is neat zin. Neat means to, zin means to grasp, right? So grasping onto subject object duality. So then we can see when we're watching the mind that a lot of that grasping is happening when we're, I'm this, I'm not that, you're this, they did that. Uh, that's all this form of neat zin or duck zin, this form of grasping. And so the natural liberation of thoughts is a Dzogchen approach to shamatha, where we're unraveling, we're undoing. And they even talk about Buddhahood without meditation, you know, like, because as long as you're sitting there thinking, I'm meditating, then there's, there's the false sense of self and, and the doer, the subject and object, the needs in. So um, you may have moments, there are, as you deepen in shamatha and samadhi, you do have non-conceptual periods of time. And that's when, you know, the, the effulgence starts to die down and you've kind of purified, purified the mind to a state where like the, the stream is of, of consciousness is flowing in a really kind of like um, subterranean way. You know, it's not superficial waves, but there's a deep river underneath that's very quiet. And so the states of shamatha are de sel mi tokpa, which is bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality. So that definitely is described as a, as a deep state of samadhi. But until that naturally arises, it's more about just extending those space between the thoughts, like Eve said, you know, feel the space in between the thoughts and develop your relationship and uh, realize emptiness in, in regards to thoughts that they aren't substantial and therefore clinging isn't necessary. But what I've been realizing, and I know this is a long answer, I'm just going on and on. I hope it's okay. But, you know, personally, I've noticed that the gripping, even like in retreat over the summer, I got to do three weeks in a cabin. And so when you do those long-term retreats, you get things start happening, right? And more than just on a Wednesday night, you know, even though great things happen on a Wednesday night too, but great things were just happening to me. <laughs> but um, when you do retreat, the natural kind of settling happens and all of this starts to make sense more and more and you start to really taste the pleasure of it in a deeper way and you develop a, a more mature relationship to your mind and meditation but um you know it's i would say become like a detective on like where you're gripping you know not just in the mind but in the body you know for me i notice i'm gripping at the at the brain stem and, and the brainstem feels like that, that, you know, they say the core delusion is ignorance. And it feels like that's where the ignorance lives. That's where the gripping happens. That's where the, uh, the fear of death, you know, the separation. That so if you, you know, the whole craniosacral rhythm, all of that stuff, where if you can unravel on that physiological way, it can help the mind also trust. And the mind, as it unravels in a good way, helps the body trust that it can let go. And then you do start to experience more of those periods of a tranquil mind, shamatha, calm abiding mind that's not pulled in the turbulence of the namtok, the discursive ideation. You got to do your time, you know. We all have to do our time. All of us. I remember when I was younger, it was easier. You know, I'd go on retreat and I'd get really high. <laughs> I would just bliss out. Something about now I'm in a different stage of my life, man. Retreat can be hard too. I talked to Lama Tsultram afterwards and I talked about my, I, I 
told her about my retreat. So this one was hard. This one, you know, was hard. You know, it was, it was a lot of things. But there were a lot of namtok. And she's like, it's funny how people think that, that retreat's supposed to be great. <laughs> it's good if it's hard, <laughs> she said. That's you're doing the work. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. It makes a lot of, it, it gives me a hope, actually. Oh, but it gives me hope that I don't, I'm not clinging to hope, but I'm feeling <laughs> like, yeah, you know, that it's like, yes, I get it. I see, because I've had those moments actually where I feel yeah. this, I like the subterranean flow idea. And then I'll also have moments where I have bliss and openness and complete, you know, open heart. So it's just an interesting uh, journey. You know, that's what I feel like I'm in right now. It's like all over the place, but getting, getting more centered. So. Thank you. You know, we can, we can do it because we did it, but because of that, we can undo it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got it. That's, that's my new Lojong slogan, Eve. I think the next series we need to just make up our own 59. Make up our Fun. own 59. Ambitious. Maybe five. Or at least a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, I see your hand. Yeah. I'm trying to think of exactly how to phrase this, but I've noticed something just increasingly when I'm meditating, when I'm doing Tom Lan. I feel like there's this like thing inside of me that is also kind of tense and dark and I find like in Tonglen I use that to kind of like be the thing that is you know when I'm breathing it in and then breathing it out and trying to release whatever this thing is and it's like the part of me that's very critical that's very uh, snarky and and when and i I've kind of noticed it's like, even though I'm doing Tonglen or I'm meditating, it's there. And I've been kind of in this state where I'm just like, okay, it's there. It's there. And I don't try and fight it exactly. I, and I'm trying to understand what's going on. Like, I don't really know what, what this is. It's just this part of me that um, I don't particularly like, <laughs> you know? either. Um, it's not my favorite part of myself. Uh, and I just, I don't know if it's like a sensation anyone else has. It's just a very like sense of, you know, when you talked about resentment tonight, I mean, that was actually really pretty heavy for me. It almost made me cry mm. because I've been going through a lot around working through resentments personally lately um, because of some things that happened in my life. Uh, and, you know, and I was like, oh, wow, that's it. I think that's that thing that's in there. Mm. It, it, I just don't know what to think about this place I'm in, you know, this kind of strange sensation where both I find like sometimes accepting it actually calms it a little. It's like a baby or something sometimes. And I, you know, I, I like see it that way sometimes. Hmm. Uh, you know, and this particular meditation really like hit something. I was like, whoa, you know. Um, and it felt good, ultimately. Uh, like, oh, I should do this more often or something. But I, I don't know if you guys have a perspective on what I'm even trying to describe here because I'm almost struggling with, with what it is. I'll pipe in. Um, thank you for sharing. And it sounds like a, a really meaningful um, meeting, you know, when, when we have those opportunities to directly touch into something deep and we have that intuition of like, oh, wow, this might trace back very deeply inside of me. Um, I do think it is, it, everything you said, your intuitions are correct across the board. 
Um, I think that what you're describing is, is a very familiar experience for myself and, and many others too, of that um, being with the part of ourself that's challenging as we're trying to transform that part that's challenging and not really liking that part. Um, it's all tangled up together. And I think the unwinding uh, or the undoing of what we've done, the new Lojong slogan, um, a lot of that is right. Like some of this material for us that's difficult is stuff that no longer serves us, but maybe quite old, right? Like you're saying, may go back to past hurts or past defenses and, um, and we don't like it. It doesn't serve us. We don't want it. And your intuition there about um, accepting, you know, that's again, very much the wisdom of both Tonglen and, and feeding your demons. And in some ways, a lot of the tantric approach of turning the poison into medicine. And that means, yeah, accepting, um, maybe honoring, not overanalyzing. You, you said a bunch, I think, I don't know what to think, I think. And I think <laughs> the thinking mind is very strong for you as it is for, for many of us. It's like an area we develop. But there also what I'm hearing is, yeah, this intuitive part coming up too of, of what wants to change. And part of that is how you're responding to this difficult material with that like tending to like a vulnerable uh, being. Because I think that's right. You know, a lot of these... Um, unwelcome and, and painful habits or patterns um, within us, they, they are, they're really like, they feel quite young or they can, and they're not um, as much as they make havoc, they are deserving of our compassion too. So I think that's a, a beautiful way. Um, I'm just yeah. like, does it ever, does like the process of meditation, accepting it ever make it kind of, you know, like I do want it to go away. I mean, there's part of me that does want to say like, no, I want to be this blissful, you know, wonderful being who's giving and kind and, you know, leave me alone, <laughs> you know, but I can't do that either. It's kind of a, you know, like, I, I don't know how to get to another place with it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you can be blissful and kind and still, um, have a lot of like unpleasant anxiety and worry and frustration and jealousy and judgment. They're not necessarily, it, I, I don't think there's for many of us, um, going to be this like end point, um, of total enlightenment. Um, and, and maybe that doesn't exist. Maybe that's the wrong paradigm. Um, maybe it's always co-occurring. You know, I have heard some teachers sh share that. I do think we get a little less stuck, just as Chandra so beautifully said. It's not the, th the stuff, it's the fixation on the stuff. Um, and sometimes that's a fixation on, I just, I can't let it go. And sometimes it's, I can't let it be, <laughs> right? Both, both are fixation. Um, and so I, I, it's, I think, and I do think it's beautiful in a way to have, that desire to be free. Um, you know, one of the teachers, Chandra and I share, talks a lot about this yearning, this really tuning into your own yearning to be free, a longing. Um, and I think we get glimpses sometimes in meditation of what that freedom feels like. And it can bring almost tears to your eyes to want to be connected to that state of um, unencumberedness, openness, because you're right, it's easier to be kind and present and available when we aren't so caught up in that past material, that unmetabolized pain. Um, and it is also probably what keeps you coming to practice and learning. And so, you know, there's, again, the perfect ingredients are all right here. Um, it's very, it's very hard. Again, this is so Lojong-like to have this meta conversation of, you know, being with this difficulty and not trying to make it something else. And um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear that you're thinking so deeply about it. And I'm sorry to hear it's a struggle, but I also um, don't think there's another way. I don't yeah, know if that, that doesn't sound in our culture. 
in yeah. our culture, I, I've really been thinking about this a lot. It's very hard in our culture to see many things are true at once. Yeah. And I've been really thinking about that a lot lately that, you know, people can be many things at once. There's just, and I'm trying to use that idea on myself and the practice and Buddhism seems to say that's okay. Yeah. Change and impermanence. And formlessness are other ways of saying that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next week, we're going to do feeding your demons. And I'm getting a sense, Laura, that this would be nice material to bring to that, you know, the challenge. And, and through the five steps of feeding your demons, we can meet those kind of obscure, maybe fuzzy feelings. You're not quite sure, like the mind can't quite get it, but it's in the body and we can feel it. Those are really great things to work with in the feeding your demons too. And it's the um, alchemical process of then feeding, not fighting that feeling, having a structure with which to meet it and then learn from it through the ally, meeting the ally. So I would say if you can come next week for that, that and bring this friend with you, you're befriending. <laughs> yeah, that could be good. Thank you. And I can also, make it next week. So. You're welcome. What? And I can make it next week. So. Yeah, that was also an opportunity to remind people that we're doing feeding your demons next week. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Does anybody else want to ask a question or should we shift into the slogan? Yeah, okay. So, drum roll. <laughs> the last slogan, the 59th slogan, is so perfect. Don't expect applause, which is such a great way to end. <laughs> Another way of translating it is don't expect thanks. But I like don't expect applause. That's Shogyam Trungpa's translation. And, um, you know, even I were giggling about how as teachers, it's really important for us to remember, you know, in our last, we've made it this long and we did it, you know. But it's not, obviously, it's a, that's a little bit more tongue in cheek. You know, we can all... We wanted to invite you to really personally contemplate and then share. You know, maybe we'll have time for, for a few people to share before the end of class about how, um, you know, in a tender kind of way, in a revealing way, like how, how in our life do we, do we still, you know, long for that recognition? I was think, feel, remembering, you know, raising my kids when they were little, there's this sweet thing that all kids do it is like, look at me, look at me, mom, dad, look at me, you know, and we're all kind of just kids in big people suits still in some funny way saying, look at me, look at me, you know, I want the applause, um, or at least an acknowledgement, and maybe we don't do that so much anymore in overt ways, but there are subtle ways too, where we might um, still be wanting the pat on the back, or Especially in terms of this slogan, um, the teach the the commentaries that I've I've uh, looked at around this slogan talk really apply this more to our Dharma practice. But we could apply this to all aspects of our life. You see this all the time in spiritual communities. You know, people want to be seen. You know, in the Tibetan communities, it's like Westerners wanting to be seen as like a special daikini or a tolku. <laughs> Like, oh, I'm special. I've got a strong relationship to Dharma. I hope this Tibetan Lama sees that and acknowledges my past karma. You know, I've, I grew up with all that kind of stuff and it makes me kind of nauseous, but it's in there. It's in there. It's in there. Those types of things are with all of us. It's within me too. I'm not saying I didn't have that, but that we all have these types of wanting to be seen. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the beauty of it. You know, a lot of these things are just our shared humanity, our tenderness. It's not like this is bad to be cut out in a negative way, but to be, to be metabolized and matured through so that when we, when those feelings come up of like feeling upset because we weren't appreciated, that's another way of wanting applause or wanting praise, which is one of the eight mundane concerns, right? Praise and blame how do we stumble and suffer because we're we're fixated on getting that and dharma practice is very much about 
learning to give that to ourselves. It's like learning to love ourselves, you know? Learning to love, learning to give yourself what you think you want from somebody else. Now, sometimes we need things from others. Of course, we're relational beings and relationships are good and juicy and great, but they're even better <laughs> when we also know how to give those things to ourselves, right? So how would it feel to give yourself praise? <laughs> The other side of praise in terms of the eight mundane concerns are, is blame. So praise and blame are these two of the eight mundane concerns. So on the other side of praise is blame and not wanting to be blamed for this, that, or the other thing. So Eve, did you, did you, can you share a tease out what, what you want around that too? There's so many nuances to these. It's like a color wheel. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I always love applying these to our, to our lived experience. And that was the inspiration for um, Tom Glenn on resentment because <laughs> this um, desire to be seen, to be applauded when it's not met, I think we can really find ourselves in resentment. Um, and when, you know, Chandra and I were just like laughing about this. So if we have, we seek praise and we don't get it and we feel resentful and we're blamed and then we get defensive. It's like the full life experience. <laughs> and, you know, they, they have different flavors, but um, resentment is, is, is incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. And um, one thing Tundra said when we were talking earlier was there's so many don'ts in <laughs> the Lojong. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do the other. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> um, and often they're pointing to, it's so pithy, right? It's not a paragraph. Like don't expect applause because if you always want people to appreciate what you're doing, maybe you'll have the wrong motivations or maybe you'll be disappointed. Like, it's just one line. And, and the line is, you know, don't expect that um, because often you will feel disappointed and that could lead to resentment. And resentment is such a specific type of uh, experience. It's, it's in, considered to be like a, an emotion associated with anger. Mm. But anger, right, it comes and goes. I'm, you know, I'm angry um, because I, cause they gave me the wrong change at the farmer's market or whatever it is, and then it's over. But with resentment, you really are working hard at it day in and day out, <laughs> keep it alive. It's an ongoing state, um, that resentment. And it just can really fester over time and become quite corrosive. And um, I, I liked Chandra's invitation for us to, to be honest and, and clear and, and reflective. Resentment is most common in our home environments, right? <laughs> yeah. So we can so feel true. it for anyone, but right. <laughs> we can feel it for anyone, but you know, there's like that, that, that experience. And I think it's, um, it's really interesting to examine it. And it's, again, it's always hardest to bring Dharma home to our families and our loved ones. Um, and what is it, what is it like, or what would it feel like to just be like, I'm done with resentment. Done. Doesn't serve me. Um, I see how transformative it could be. Can't imagine how um, challenging it would be unless you completely lived alone. Then you might resent yourself. Hmm. So yeah, I'd be I'd, I'd definitely be eager to um, hear if any folks had thoughts on that slogan, on that invitation. Yeah. Let's open it up. You can either raise your maybe raise your hand if you want to share verbally or put. Um the chat in if you feel like just typing something in but then we can call you know how there's the reactions okay yeah i can raise your real hand yeah nick hi <laughs> yeah nick. hi hey uh yeah this one you know to me it's like uh you know uh, do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. you now don't don't expect applause don't you know oh you know i, I helped an elderly person across the street where's you know where's the flaw and it's not i, I shouldn't be doing that that's, if that's my motivation then i need to look at 
why I'm doing what I'm doing, I think. And, and Eve, you, you kind of touched on it. You talked about um, having a mature relationship to your mind. <laughs> and that kind of, that kind of, you know, I, I kind of resonated with me. It's like, oh yeah, that's, that's what that is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I have to think about what I'm thinking about and what I'm, you know, what I feel like doing, what am I moved to do, mm -hmm. you know, and why am I moved to do it? You know, so I, that's what I got out of that. And I, I sorry, mm -hmm. I came in at the tail end of this discussion of the, of the slogans, but uh, thanks for that. That's what, that's my, my feeling I got from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's great. That's right on. Thank you. We really want to hear from you if you feel no resentment, because we absolutely want to understand more about everything you have for breakfast and lunch, your daily routines. <laughs> so yes, isn't this source of resentment based on the fact that we don't get what we want? Yes. And in this case, it's applause, right? Or it's being seen, um, being appreciated. And um, it's interesting, Chandra, especially in the context of, of practice or being a practitioner, um, it's such a slippery slope. Like we do wanna be seen by others as um, dedicating ourselves to practice. And there can be maybe part of it that is wholesome, but it's, uh, it's interesting. Like, what is it we're not getting, you know, to the point of that comment? Um, if we aren't getting what we want, what is it that we want when we uh, want applause? for our practice, I guess, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be viewed as good. Mm -hmm. Be loved. That's always what it comes down to for me. <laughs> we, 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 want, we want love. Want to feel loved, feel acknowledged. Feel acknowledged for who we are. I like, it's nice we're having some good comments come in too from Jason and Walt. Yeah, uh, I sat in a work meeting today and was aware of how much I wanted to shout out <laughs> recognition. I, it was an awkward moment. I felt like I was watching myself wanting to be recognized, being disappointed because I wasn't, feeling of resentment because <laughs> others weren't being recognized. It was the perfect thing to reflect on today's slogan. Yeah. It's so tender, our, um, yeah, our sense of, of wanting to be seen and wanting to be loved and cared about. And it's pretty amazing, especially because our emotions get triggered so quickly. It's a good thing there's mute. I mean, you could have shouted probably in the meeting. I don't know. Um, and with Walt, when I overconsumed alcohol, resentment explained every shortcoming, shortfall in my life. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You know, um, alcohol can obviously toxify the liver and in Chinese medicine, they, they say that the, when the liver is stagnant or toxic, it expresses itself as anger. Mm. And you had talked about earlier that resentment is a form of anger, right, Eve? So it probably it's like the resentment and anger causing the alcohol probably, uh, you know, consumption to a certain extent, but then also perpetuating, <laughs> perpetuating it through a kind of feedback loop. Yeah, it's toxic, the anger, resentment, isn't it? It can poison us too, even without any outside substances. Anger is very, very strong poison sometimes, but that can be transmuted into nectar. That's the whole tantric approach, which is really great. You know, it means we can work with it. We don't have to cut it out. We can transmute it and use that, the fire, the energy, the clarity that anger brings mm -hmm. and develop our wisdom nature through that energy, just like de transmuting desire, the sexual, you know, desire and other so-called poisons into the path. So it's not all bad, you know, mm -hmm. Hugh, were you raising your hand? 
was. And Eve, I know you work with clinicians, and I yeah. have some other clinicians that I know are uh, therapists or in this meeting. And clinicians often feel un unappreciated by institutions, mm. and those are those are tough jobs. And, yeah. And, and yeah. And in my practice, my clinical practice, I work with some nurses that have boy, they've been there. For, They've been nurses a long time, and they feel unappreciated by the institution. And I, I speak of myself, solace. Um, I work with the elderly, um, end of life, some end of life stuff. But like families remember you, and hmm. I, I sort of give myself solace with that. Like you make a difference with one patient at a time, one family at a hmm. time. And even if people don't thank you, or maybe institutions don't thank you, but these yeah. these people remember you. Hmm. And, and stepping up for them, I mean, so that, that sort of sees me through on a on a good day. That's beautiful, and I think that's like a, a wholesome recognition, right? Because it's still it's like relating to your aspiration to be of service, and um, you're so right. I mean, you know, so in the burnout literature, resentment would be called cynicism, and it's it's a huge part of um, of systemic dysfunction, um, of just feeling like, not only is this not good, it doesn't even have to be this way, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, cynicism often comes not only with that resentment of not being recognized and seen, but also being blocked in your ability to do what's being asked of you because of systemic shortfalls, uh, shortcomings, and, um, and other like complexity. So there's, you know, there is very um, reasonable resentment, just like there's totally reasonable anger. And yet, you know, I, I think it's Lao Tzu who says it's, you know, it's like a, a potion that is more toxic for that who holds it than whatever it's spilled upon. Like anger is, is the opposite of peace of mind in my experience. You know, if, if I start every day with this hope, may I, may I have peace of mind if that's my ultimate aspiration Anger is like a, a really big obstacle. Um, it can really follow you, especially that resentment anger, right? That we get day in and day out, um, working for an institution that feels unsupportive, exploitative, um, you know, maybe harmful even to the to people we are intending to serve. That resentment is very real um, and can really create a sense of ongoing frustration. And I think you really hit it on the head of like, well, where can I find meaning? And sometimes that's with like patients and sometimes it's with colleagues and sometimes it's with how can I show up? Because often there's like nothing we can do. I got a, a relative reality level to, to change situations and circumstances, but we can still find meaning, um, which is interesting. You know, I think of a, uh, what would it be like to apply the Lojong slogans in a pithy way um, for folks experiencing burnout, you know? And uh, it's interesting because it really focuses on, of course, individual level training um, and individual level um, reframing and reappraisal. And, but I do think the Tonglen practice too, I mean, if it's possible to do Tonglen for dysfunctional institutions. That's a high level practice, but that's close to freedom, I'd say. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, Walt has a great comment that, that makes me think of like, you know, decolonizing our mind from mm -hmm. getting things right or wrong. And the applause is a feed, mm. feeding into that type of mentality, like as we learn as children, right? That's a good point, Walt. I mean, what you said, I, I it got me thinking in that return regard as well. And I'm not sure if that's where you were going with it, but um, I'm aware of time oh, and yeah. our intention to do a little mantra recitation. Yeah. What do you want to Love say? It. I just was going to say, I really, uh, Claudia also um, and Diane left wonderful comments here. Um, yeah. About the educational system. I mean, and then using humor. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's really our only thing. And I'm just going to share this really quick link uh, on the topic of feeding your demons. There's a free conference this weekend put on by uh, 
Ligmincha. I don't really know how to say it. Sorry about that. Uh, there's a session with Lama Sultra Malioni on feeding your demons. Yeah, great. And um, I'll be presenting a little bit of our research study that we are finally getting towards publication. Yay. Um, but there's some really wonderful teachers and teachings, um, totally free. And if it's going to be rainy here all weekend, I mean, may as well. There's often conferences where it's science and spirituality, and it's really science. This one, I think, is actually deeply spirituality. So um, I'm looking forward to it. That's great. Okay, so I was I thought we would do Tara, who's Ariyatara Noble Tara, who's the female Buddha of compassion, often represented as a green Tara, but there's white Tara, red Tara, blue Tara, uh, golden Tara. There's all sorts of different expressions of her. I've talked about Tara. Um, that's who I'm. I'm doing research and writing a book on the 21 expressions of the the Great Mother right now. And so this is her ten syllable mantra. This is like her root mantra. Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha. I've pasted it a couple times in there. I think if you need what need to, you can scroll up a few boxes to see it. Um, Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha. Okay, it means O Tara, please come swiftly near, come to me near O Tara. Um, may it be so. So we're we're opening our hearts to her. She's said to be the the one who saves beings from the suffering of samsara. So there's this feeling of we can call out for ourselves, but also for all of humanity, for the world, for the environment, for beings, animals, humans, seen and unseen, just this feeling of praying for the welfare of all beings and asking for the blessings of the Great Mother. So take a few breaths, let's settle in, and it's not about sounding good, it's about opening your heart and feeling the vibration of the sound, that's what mantra is, it's like a magical formula, like a magic spell that helps to open up the vibration and the, ener like the, um, the portal to that particular deity or energy, even you can just feel it as energy, love, in its most essential form. You can sing along or listen as you wish. Just feel your breath in your body, your heart. Let the throat open and be soft and make a nice, joyful noise. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha 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 om. 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 Tare tu tare. 
May we feel and experience the grace and the embrace of the mother, the warmth, love. And know that that's always here with us. Dedicate the merit of our time and our full exploration of the 59 slogans together for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you. Pleasure to teach with you, Eve, which is going to keep going. So next week will be a Feeding Your Demons session with me. And then the following week, November 3rd, we kick off our new book study group, which is this book, On the Path to Enlightenment. On the Path to Enlightenment. So you can get it in real, you know, paper form, or you can get the audio book as well, which I love. And or not, just come to class and enjoy. And uh, we'll just make our way through the book. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Pam and Mace, Jason, everyone else. Great to see you. Hi, everybody. You can unmute and say goodbye if you want. Om Dari Tutari Ture Swaha. Bye. 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 Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.